Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky, and those of you who are regular viewers, and I hope that's many of you, will notice that this is not the Wilson Center studio. In fact, it's my basement because we, like the rest of the world, are in lockdown mode, and we're continuing to bring you the quality content that you count on from the Wilson Center, only we're doing it remotely. And today we have two terrific guests to share their insights with you. Joining me is uh, Robert Daly and Abraham Denmark. Robert is director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States, and Abe is the director of the Wilson Center's Asia program. And they're gonna join us today to talk about China and China's role in the pandemic, things that people are saying about China and things that China is saying about itself. Gentlemen, welcome, thank you for joining us. Thank you, good to see you. Good to see you as well under the circumstances, really good to see all of you. Uh, you know, I'm, as I was thinking about how to begin our discussion, I thought maybe we'll go straight to the bottom line. And I'm thinking of a Billy Joel lyric, we didn't start the fire. Uh, who started the fire? Is China to blame for the pandemic that the world is experiencing at this moment? Abe, let's begin with you. I think China is absolutely to blame for failing to contain the, the outbreak in China and allowing it to break out. And that's I, to me, is that's a function less of, of uh, a specific strategy and rather just a reflection of a lot of the problems that China's system has in terms of um, trying to hide information, um, infiltrating different organizations, which limits their ability to react to these sorts of things. Um, so certainly they have a lot of responsibility for this outbreak uh, getting out of China, but for each government, it's their, been their responsibility in terms of how they've reacted and how they've tried to protect their own people. Robert? Well, I, I strongly agree with uh, everything that Abe just said and in some of the things that he's recently written about this. You know, d who started the fire? Well, first you need to note that there be fires. There, there are fires in this world. They're going to come around about. Um, some of them are financial crises. Some of them are pandemics. They all begin, begin somewhere. And do we want to be in the business every time there is a crisis of demanding reparations or recriminations in every case? That's a sort of a broad question. And while I think that China unquestionably uh, bears considerable responsibility uh, for this, not only at the beginning in, in their clampdown, but for some of their ongoing uh, behaviors, which as Abe says are, are characteristic. It's not just that they're covering up and perhaps falsifying statistics, it's that journalists and scholars within China who are trying to get these information out and who have been critical uh, are being disappeared. At the same time, I think that this critique of China as responsible for everything, at least in the United States, has gone a little bit too far. The critique implies that had China been entirely transparent, we of course would have been entirely wise and strategic. And we know that not to be the case. Uh, and so I think that that should, uh, for now, give us a little bit of humility and have us turning towards solving the problem, saving lives, and cooperating to do so, if that's indicated. Your answers uh, speak to a number of issues that we can dig into a little more deeply. And one I want to begin with is some of the things Abe said about what was revealed, or at least what we were reminded of about China's system of okay. government. Uh, did you learn anything new, or is this all predictable based on the patterns that we've seen? That to me? Sure, uh, we'll start with you, Robert. So, no, I think th these were all established patterns, uh, and what we learned is that these patterns still obtain. I lived in China throughout 2003 uh, when the SARS uh, epidemic within China hit and was running an, an operation for Johns Hopkins University there. And so I got to study that close up uh, with the epidemiologists at Johns Hopkins. And following SARS, the American CDC and other organizations have continually worked very, very closely with Chinese epidemiologists who have really upped their game in a number of ways. And if we look back to SARS, I think it's safe to say uh, China clearly should have known better. Its professional class did. Its pro its political class did not. And that's where the, the gap occurred. Uh, not a big surprise, but a big disappointment. Abe, any thoughts on this? Did you learn anything new or was this pretty much what you would have expected under the circumstances? Yeah, uh, like, like Robert, uh, to me, this really seemed to confirm a lot of my, my understanding about how things worked in China, that um, the way their political system works is uh, makes it so that when a scientist or a doctor raises a red flag and says, there's a problem here, we have a disease that someone needs to contain, 
the initial political reaction is not to go into action and try to contain the virus, but rather to suppress indications of problems, of weaknesses. And in this case, that led to the disease spreading. There's been some terrific reporting about how the disease got out of Wuhan and spread across China. Um, and that to me is a reflection not of a specific decision by Beijing to uh, just let this go and see what happens, but rather a structural, an indication of structural problems uh, in which officials are encouraged to keep things quiet uh, and try to convey an image of stability even when there are real problems going on. In fairness to China, they're not the only nation that has been accused of perhaps reacting politically more than from a public health perspective. And this is all contextual, so it's compared to what? Uh, Robert, we'll begin with you and then we'll come back to Abe on this. What about this notion of how the rest of the world has responded in comparison to China? Does China deserve special criticism or are they right in the pack? Well, it, it began in China. Uh, and so for the reasons that, that Abe described, it was China and only China that had it handled it well in a, in, in a normal way that epidemiologists prescribe at the beginning. There's a lot of reason to think that the pain within China itself, of course, first and foremost, had, had they had treated this well, and then throughout the world, uh, could have been mitigated and, and greatly reduced. So China's failures are characteristic of its system. Perhaps the failures in other nations are characteristic there. Xi Jinping did come to this having been through a, a terrible year. You had an economic slowdown. You had the trade war with the United States. You had the general deterioration of relations with the United States not foreseen. You had global blowback against his signature Belt and Road Initiative, which China didn't handle well. And then, of course, you had uh, Tsai Ing-wen being reelected, very much uh, against the wishes of Beijing as the president of Taiwan. You had protests in Hong Kong. You had the situation in Xinjiang and more attention on human rights. And so she was under a lot of pressure, and his governance of China uh, was being called increasingly into question in China when the pandemic hit. And so that, it's reasonable to think, uh, added to the, their characteristic desire to cover everything up, might well have made it worse. Abe, any thoughts? And following on that, we, uh, in the Asia program, we uh, published an analysis looking at uh, three Asian countries uh, that had uh, good, um, uh, good responses to this crisis in Singapore, in Taiwan, and South Korea, uh, each of which got the same information that we did from the Chinese, uh, the same information that we did from the WHO, uh, yet their responses were much more effective. Um, I actually ran the numbers a few days ago if you look at infection rates per capita, uh, for example, South Korea, uh, the United States would have uh, less than half of the number of infections than we have today, um, based on how this, the rate of infection that we've seen in South Korea. Um, so certainly I think there's a lot of blame to go around right now as we're recording this. There's uh, just about one and a half million people around the world infected, uh, confirmed infected. So there's plenty of blame to go around. I think China deserves a great deal of it. Um, but in terms of how each country reacted, we've seen that uh, fast, decisive, informed reactions saved lives. And some countries have done that and others have failed. Abe, the, and the report you mentioned is available at the Asia Program's web uh, page on wilsoncenter.org. I should let our viewers know that as well. Um, yeah. President Xi, bad year that Robert described. Does he emerge from this unscathed or is his standing wounded, not just internationally, but within the Communist Party? Is that to me or to Robert? Sure, we could start with you, of course. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that it's, it's my, my sense would be that it's damaged his um, base of power a bit uh, in that it's shown that his handling of this has been a bit problematic. I think it, his star had been dulled a little bit already in the face of uh, all the challenges that Robert just described in terms of its relationship with the United States, uh, the slowing of its economy, which was al already happening um, before uh, before the coronavirus hit. Uh, but I don't think that that at this point leads to um, indications that they may, there may be a, a move to uh, replace him from leadership. Uh, the My sense of understanding in terms of how Chinese political elites look at these issues is that in times of vulnerability, uh, they need stability at the top, they need unified leadership at the top. Um, and my expectation is that Xi Jinping is going to uh, remain in power. I think he's still the, by far the most powerful person in China. A lot will depend on China's ability to recover 
economically uh, and how quickly they're able to recover. Uh, but broadly speaking, I think Xi Jinping certainly took a hit here, but I think he's still here uh, to stay for a while. Mm -hmm. Robert. And uh, in addition to all of that, the internationalization of the disease also helped Xi Jinping, as did its mishandling in other countries and the United States in particular. So there's been a tremendous amount of propaganda within China and also it would seem a genuine amount of pride that uh, after the initial mishandling, which the Chinese people themselves were absolutely enraged about, uh, China was able to get this under relatively good control. Uh, the United States and other countries haven't. And so this has helped with the Communist Party's presenting this not as a Chinese problem, but a human problem. Of course, it's, it's both. It's a Chinese problem first, and then a human problem. There is also in China, and I, I spent uh, Thursday night on the phone, on, on Zoom, uh, with a number of Chinese scholars on this. There is a lot of popular anger now in China against the United States for labeling this as the Chinese virus, the Wuhan virus for the American politicians suggestions, which did precede the very ugly Chinese conspiracy theories that we then heard, but we, we, we moved first, uh, suggesting that this had actually leaked either deliberately or accidentally uh, from a Chinese uh, biochemical lab. There's no evidence for this. So a, a tremendous amount of, of anger about all of that uh, and the uh, racist attacks that we have seen in America against Chinese and Asian Americans are of course widely reported uh, in China. And so this has also moved, it's not just a question of what politicians' prospects are, it really seems to have changed popular opinion in both countries where there's a tremendous amount of anger right now. Gentlemen, the, this, this situation has not peaked globally and so we don't really know what all the bills that will come due will be, but we could suspect that some people will win and some people will lose. If China's global standing were to drop in ways that affects their economy, their, their uh, a place in the world as a base of manufacturing, for example, who stands to win from that? What countries, whether it's India, Vietnam, what do you anticipate in that regard, Abe? I think a lot depends on how other countries react. You know, the uh, Asia Development Bank just uh, released their projections for the next few years adjusted uh, for the coronavirus. And um, their uh, assessment was that China's economy is expected to grow at about 2.3% this year. Um, but they also projected a fast recovery to uh, more than 7% in 2021, which is a pretty robust recovery. And re they really see the rest of developing Asia uh, um, recovering as well, um, growing at about 2.3%. Uh, but if you look at the numbers coming out of the United States, uh, we just had another jobs report saying that uh, over the last few weeks, over 16 million Americans are unemployed. Um, it's probably worse than that considering the gig economy. Um, economists are expecting uh, pretty routinely that, uh, the, that we may hit 25% unemployment, uh, the peak of the, uh, the Great Depression numbers. Um, so I think the United States and Europe are going to take a hit. Um, I think the uh, power shift from uh, to Asia that we had already seen is likely to accelerate. Um, but I also, one piece that hasn't been discussed much is how this is going to affect uh, the poorest parts of the world uh, in terms of Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm thinking of you know, the slums in India and Pakistan uh, where people don't have access to clean water to wash their hands regularly, let alone good healthcare systems. So I think that if, when coronavirus gets into these populations, it's gonna be absolutely devastating. Um, so I don't know if anybody wins from this. I think that there's countries that get hit, um, uh, that whose hits are limited, some countries whose hits are substantial, and some countries whose hits are absolutely devastating. Uh, Robert, what you know, President Trump is always trying to uh, be a bit of a salesman and talk about quick recoveries and quick turnarounds. What is the discussion in China about Ch the Chinese economy's ability to bounce back in any sort of rapid manner? Well, uh, remember that they were in the midst of a very long slowdown before uh, the coronavirus emerged. And the slowdown uh, was not well understood beforehand. Part of it was policy driven. Since 2013, China has been aiming for slower, more sustainable growth based on domestic demand, services, and moving up the technology manufacturing chain. And this, and this had been a, a policy goal of slowing down. They knew they weren't going to do 10% or even 6% forever. 
Uh, now, how much of the slowdown that we had seen before the coronavirus was attributable to that, those policies and how much to other factors, including the trade war, is very difficult to say. Uh, the Chinese are now uh, trying to open up and get back to work, like the United States, for somewhat different reasons. They also face an enormous problem with unemployment for the first time in a very long time, and it's not clear how resilient their systems will be for dealing with that. One of the problems that they have that we don't have is a very large number of, of migrant workers who have their homes in one part of the country, usually poorer towns or villages, and who work in larger cities uh, and who, frankly, tend to be not entirely welcomed by the local populations who need them and are seen as perhaps vectors for disease and other social ills. What, how they recover there, we don't know. China, although it is trying to again, turn towards domestic demand, and that's been increasing, is still dependent on foreign exports and demand is going to be down in the United States, in Western Europe. So uh, I think far too many uncertainties to hazard any kind of guess now as to how this is going to go. China, like the United States, has a daunting domestic to-do list uh, and is going to be focused, I think, primarily on that uh, while using this opportunistically and strategically insofar as they can to increase their global status. That's going to be you know, what, what they're mostly about. Uh, the gentlemen, the points that both of you make about those who are struggling before this pandemic hit and what they face in the aftermath are almost too disturbing to fully contemplate at this time because we just don't know how bad it's going to get before it begins to get better. Uh, I want to expand our discussion before we close it to the bigger picture about globalization. And a lot of people, including the, the chief of the WHO and the, the various global leaders, including President Macron and others, have likened this struggle to World War II as far as what the world is facing. Now, in World War II, we had the grand coalition of the allies versus the coalition of the Axis. And this moment seems as if it would scream out for leadership, uh, international leadership. And much of the discussion on US-China relations before this was about a competition for that role in the world between China and the United States. What are your thoughts on this big picture about the possibility of someone emerging as the leader who brings the world together in a way that really ends this crisis in the most positive manner possible? Abe, hey, go first. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, from an, I, I think that the chances of, uh, to me, there's only one, two countries that have the, the size, the scale, to really act as leaders in the international system right now. Um, one China, the other the United States. I, my sense is that there's simply too much anger and resentment towards China um, and other parts of the world uh, in which they would embrace or feel comfortable with China establishing itself as a leader. Um, based on my conversations with, uh, with uh, scholars and colleagues in Europe and other parts of the world, um, China is conducting some assistance. It's providing some uh, medical supplies, uh, but that's not having a huge political effect. These countries aren't going to start aligning um, with China. Um, I think there's really two more outcomes are more likely. Um, one is that uh, if the United States is able to recover uh, rapidly in terms of its, its economy, uh, but also if the United States is able, it chooses to lead. Um, so far, I think we've seen the United States choose not to lead, to the surprise of, of many of us, as we have in the past with so many other crises. Uh, I still think that there's a window of opportunity there um, in terms of uh, leading a recovery, leading reform that comes out of uh, this crisis. Um, but uh, to me, that's really the, the best outcome from my perspective. I do think we'll still see um, trending, uh, geopolitics trending towards multipolarity, uh, but we may see some version of, a, of globalization surviving over the long term. Um, but you know, European integration is likely to be weaker going forward as well. Uh, but if that doesn't happen, I don't see the alternative as being Chinese leadership, but rather I see that I expect that the uh, international system would be increasingly atomized in that there would be deep reluctance to rely on anybody, either the United States or China. Um, in terms of the establishment of more regional spheres of influence as possible. Uh, and personally, as a security person, I, I fear the, uh, the rise of uh, uh, nuclear proliferation as countries look to alternatives for American extended deterrence commitments. But either way, I think it's clear that uh, this crisis is going to reshuffle international, the international power structure 
in, in ways that are very difficult to imagine right now. Uh, are the international economy is going to take a, a big hit. There's, I think, a lot of uh, skepticism about allowing China to be uh, the country that other countries depend on, to uh, allow it to be a driving force in international institutions. Uh, but what comes after that, I think, is still very much to be decided. Thanks, Abe. Robert, final thoughts? Yeah, one, one general note and then something on China. Um, you know, this happened very suddenly and it's very destructive, it's frightening, and there are a lot of unknowns. And I see uh, the United States and China and the other nations I follow as being very much caught up right now in the tyranny of the now, very much in the present moment. Uh, and of course, everything is changing. Uh, the sky is always uh, falling. I think that we tend to underestimate the forces that drive toward a return to the normal after every crisis. And there will be some of that as well. There are going to be tremendous pressures, domestic and international, to reseek existing patterns, some of which we'll find are closed off to us, uh, but, but, but some of which aren't. You know, it, it's, this is the only story in the newspapers right now, but that really doesn't mean that it's all that's going on. And we had already seen, and I agree with Abe about multilateralism being the trend, this had, uh, existed before the coronavirus. Is there going to be a reshuffling? Maybe, but if, if you have a randomized deck of cards and you reshuffle it, it's still a randomized deck of cards. Uh, so I, I think we need to look for a somewhat longer view, and I think we'll see forces coming back to normalcy. I would agree strongly with Abe uh, that China is not going to emerge from this as the global leader of choice. There is no sign of this. There's a very simplistic, mechanistic narrative in China right now that whichever country provides the medical equipment will emerge as the global leader. Don't see it. There's no sign of this. Yes, people need respirators and ventilators and test kits and all of this sort of thing. And some of those are coming from China and some of them are up to standard and are helping countries. And that's a good thing. That's a public good and we should welcome it. But there's no evidence that any nation is making a leap from that toward wanting Chinese, more Chinese influence, more Chinese governance. Uh, we simply don't see it. Uh, we don't know what the final decision of other nations is going to be about China's responsibility. And the way that China is conveying both its propaganda uh, and its medical equipment is so nakedly self-interested and opportunistic in a number of cases that it's actually turning nations off. And we see this even among some of uh, China's closer friends, uh, that it's not simply a case of they give the face masks, they get the power. I don't, that's not what I see happening. Gentlemen, as always, your ability to think beyond the passions of the moment, connect some dots and look at the trend lines and not just the headlines is dazzling and informative. And I always feel smarter having had the opportunity to speak with you. So thank you for all of the insights that you provided today. Thank you. And I should tell our viewers that if you'd like to hear more of, of that type of analysis from both the Kissinger Institute and the Asia program, come to wilsoncenter.org. Both Robert and Abe have been out there. They're in the media and they're doing program programming from home as well. And they have lots to offer, as you just learned today. Hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now. We'll be returning with more to help you ride out this storm. We hope you'll join us then. Until then, for all of us at the center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for watching.